Hello, Mason, what's up? <laughs> hey, Mark, what's up? How are you? I'm doing great. Um, you're in what, Colorado, is that right? Yeah, I, I recently moved to Colorado and uh, yeah, it's been a really great, uh, great time. So, yeah. But you hail from these parts, uh, up in Minnesota, or you been? I, I do consider myself a Minneapolis person through ah. and through. Um, I didn't grow up in Minnesota, um, but I moved there after college and fell in love with the Twin Cities. And so I am a, a, a Twin Cities person through and through. Oh, awesome. I'm so happy to hear that. I moved away for 25 years myself, and then I was like, oh, man. My. It just it stayed in my heart and the cold uh, the cold brought you back or what <laughs> uh well that was not really high on my list uh but i don't mind it i don't mind it the cold never bothered me anyway as they say <laughs> <laughs> so um i i saw that you just recently what you defended your masters in theology i, I called you an aspiring theologian but really you're actually more than aspiring you probably are are you officially am a i know is that is that Am, am I officially a theologian now? Let's go with that. Congratulations. Welcome. Well, one of the, the to-do things on my list today is that I need to actually officially submit my thesis. I defended it, but then, then you go through like a revision process and everything, and then you submit it to the, the, the seminary library. And so I got to do that today. Um, by that point, I don't know, like it just, I, to me, it doesn't really feel official until I'm actually like walking across the stage and I get my diploma. That's when it will feel official. And maybe at that point I can change the aspiring to officially the theologian. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. But, but in your heart, you already are, right? Uh, I mean, I don't know. Do, Cause maybe it, I'm a theologian. I feel like, it, does it, I don't know. I feel like everybody's a theologian and I like to think that, but also if I like called myself a theologian, like if I was like, hey, I'm a theologian and I say that on Twitter, like, I don't know, does that feel pretentious? I don't know, maybe it does, I don't know. It, it just means that you studied a lot, in my opinion, you know, you put it, in a lot of I work. I guess so, but not as much as a PhD person. Maybe I have to get a PhD before I can call oh, myself Oh my gosh, that. yeah, there's that cycle, it's just never ending, it's just never enough education, I right? know. I don't know. That's nuts. You know, maybe at some point I need to call myself a theologian. I don't know. It, maybe, maybe not. I don't. I really don't know. I maybe, really maybe, don't. maybe it's kind of like the term Christian. Maybe we should just let other people call us that. Like I've always said that. Like, if right? you want to call me a Christian, you call. I call myself a Christian. But if you don't want to call me a Christian, that's fine. Like, I'm not going to take offense to that. Right. Right. Wasn't that kind of like back in the early days? It's like it was a term that people they called other people Christians when they saw that they were exhibiting Christ-like behavior. Is that? Is that similar? Yeah, the, the followers of the way. Um, yeah, it probably would have been, especially early on, it would have been hard to say that you were a Christian unless you exhibited what people thought were, that's that's like Jesus, and I'm going to call you that then. Uh, yeah, that's probably the way it was back then. And we're going to tell you how to get back to that kind of living in three easy steps. Right. That's right, yeah. <laughs> For just $274, you will take our course. and. <laughs> Oh, we'll get Mason, back into the, the, that, the good old days of Christianity. Absolutely. I, I have to tell you, um, I recently voted you um, person on Twitter most likely to get a book deal in 2022. I just, that was my... Where was, was the, where is, there was a vote of that? Yeah, it was just me. I mean, it was only me. Oh. But, uh, but, I've, but I, when I look at you and I see what you're doing and I see your mind and how you communicate, I'm like, this guy's got a book deal coming. I can feel it. Well, I don't know about 2022. I would rather take a nap in 2022 now that I'm finishing up my master's degree. Um, but maybe 2023, maybe we can look to that okay. back here. But uh, 2022, I don't think it's quite likely that there will be a book deal yet, but who knows, maybe 2023 will usher in. Maybe I'll be done with my nap by then and I'll be fine to sign a book deal. I, 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 I look forward to reading whatever you create. Uh, I, I, really, I really don't know like much about you, but I know that what I have kind of seen on, on YouTube and some of the things that you've written, I, I think that we share an upbringing that was kind of in a more conservative Christianity. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm so fascinated to hear about your journey and how you've, um, how you've landed where you've landed, how you've maintained your sanity. Like, like what, do you mind kind of just filling us on some of your, your journey in, in conservative Christianity and then as you moved. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I, I grew up uh, in like what I felt like was the heart of evangelicalism. Uh, 
not in Nashville, but uh, in, in South Dakota, but in terms of like the actual religious experience, it felt like the heart of evangelicalism. I was raised on Veggie Tales. I lis listened to Christian alternative music. Uh, I got into my John Piper phase when I was in middle school and high school. Like I felt like I was the prototypical evangelical, uh, you know, growing up in purity culture, all the things, all the things, right? And I, I very much was in the heart of it, in the belly of the beast, if you will. And, you know, it was later on, like starting in high school that I started to have some questions about my faith. Uh, I started listening to some secular music. Uh, I was really into comedy. I loved like different stand-up comedians and, you know, they always had lots of things to say about religion that I was like, ooh, I don't know if I really like that, but I like think it's funny. So there's that, yeah. uh, you know, so I started having some of these other influences on my life and, and I certainly was starting to get really frustrated with purity culture. And like my body was saying one thing about like my desires and my, the church was saying something different. And so I started to really feel a disconnect there. Um, and so, yeah, I started having lots of different, uh, lots, lots of different, uh, questions about my faith and went into a very small Christian college, I actually went in as a youth ministry major, like really wanting to be in ministry, but having questions about my faith. Uh, and it was there that I was able to read lots of books that really opened up my mind, even though it was a small Christian college. And for the most part, it was pretty conservative, but for whatever reason, that religion department was very much not conservative. And so I started reading books from lots of different other Christians that um, made me realize that there's lots of other different kinds of Christianities out there, not just the evangelicalism I'd grown up in. And uh, that really opened up my mind to thinking about my faith very differently. All those kind of questions I had had in high school, now I was able to like actually explore them in college. And so, yeah, I it really moved me towards that kind of version of Christianity. And so at no point did I ever like really leave Christianity. I certainly uh, was really frustrated with the church. I was really frustrated with evangelicalism. Um, but then very, very quickly, I was exposed to a very different kind of Christianity and um, was really uh, entranced by it. I, w I just was soaked up into it. And, uh, and that has led me to where I'm at today. Uh, certainly even from that time, I the time I was in college, uh, and starting to think of Christianity very differently. I'm thinking about it very differently now. Um, right. but at least that like initial time in college has really set me onto the, onto the trajectory that I'm on now. Wow. Thank you for all that. I, I there's so many things going through my head. I want to like, uh, like Christian alternative. That's like, that was crazy. That's very liberal from, <laughs> you know, like, I've, you know, as opposed to like Sandy Patty and, you know, Amy Grant, right, right, you know, yeah. so like the fact that you got to listen to rock music, I'm very jealous of that. That's wonderful. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I grew up like, you know, Switchfoot, Reliant K, especially that Tooth and Nail World. In fact, I host a podcast where I interview lots of like tooth and nail artists. Yeah. And uh, I love it. I, I really still love that world. Um, it, it was very Christian uh, and it was safe for me as a kid to grow up uh, listening to that. My parents, like as long as they knew it was on tooth and nail, they could trust it. Wow. Um, but, uh, but yeah, those bands were, I think, legitimately really good bands. And uh, <laughs> I still to this day listen to a lot of that music. And I love talking with those artists from, from that time period. That's awesome. I'm going to put a link to that podcast, both of your podcasts in the show okay, notes. Thank make you. sure people can uh, find out about that. Um, when you started to kind of um, feel a dissonance maybe between the way you were feeling and maybe some questions that you had and kind of the responses that you maybe were getting from those in authority. Um, I'm wondering, it almost sounded like you want to, like you double down, like you're like, no, I'm going to be a youth minister. Like I'm going to, I'm just going to, yeah. I need to di dive in more. Is that fair to say? Yeah. I don't know if it was like intentional that right. I wanted to like, kind of like, you know, like middle, uh, like, uh, you know, F you to the system. And I'm right. actually going to be more Christian. Uh, that ended up happening ironically, <laughs> but I don't know if it was me intentionally trying to do that. I, even though for, for me in, in that time period, even though my faith was radically changing and evolving, I still, at the end of the day, wanted to work with youth. Like yeah. I cared about like the way youth were thinking about their faith and wrestling with their faith. Yeah. And I wanted to be a part of that process. Yes. And so even though uh, why I wanted to be a youth minister had changed, the fact that I wanted to be a youth minister hadn't changed. Um, and so, you know, the, and wanting to be in ministry, wanting to be in the Christian world, none of that, like the fact that I wanted to still be in it, none of that changed. It was just more of why I wanted to be a part of that. All of that had changed. 
Um, you know, I went from wanting to be like a youth minister as like a missionary out, uh, you know, out there in the world to like, now I just want to work with like youth in a church, like maybe a progressive church and so that they can like explore the big questions of life. Um, uh, rather than I want to be a youth minister. So a bunch of kids can, you know, convert their souls to Jesus Christ. So, you know, the why of that had changed, but the fact that I still wanted to work with youth is still the reason why I still wanted, or the fact that I still wanted to work in the Christian world and work in ministry and all of that, none of that had changed at all. Yeah. I love that for, for me, I kind of doubled down by, I'm going to be awesome at being like super Christian and I'm going to sing Christian music and I'm going to do my hair and you know wear the right clothes and say the right things and make people feel all the emotions and I and and that's what made me end up moving to Nashville and you know going on that trajectory for a while and uh because I felt like that was the way that I would please God you know was just by doing more and being better there was a there was a complete lack of understanding my my belovedness like my identity as the mm-hmm. beloved um, and I feel like that's kind of what is emerging out of this new theology that that, that some people are calling this progressive you know it's like this this new theology of being the beloved like the original blessing rather than the original curse and we could go down that path deep but I want to go back just a little bit when you were when you were in that phase where you were like uh, maybe you went to college and you started like reading other books. How did you, maybe, maybe you weren't aware at the time, but how do you discern even now, like what voices to listen to? Because, you know, there's plenty that go this way, the dress is purple and the other group goes, the dress is green. And then there's like, you know, 30,000 other people with right. a different shade of each of those colors. And like, how, how do you, how do you discern what voices yeah. to listen to in this process? Yeah, this was like kind of the radical transformation. And it honestly was the scariest part of like that initial, if you will, deconstruction of recognizing that maybe there was something there, like the spirit of God was actually like moving within my body and that I actually could listen to that. Yes. Um, You know, so much of the Christianity I'd grown up in had told me, you don't want to, you know, don't go along with the flesh. Right. Uh, and the only way you can know of the spirit is by what you read in the Bible. And, but yet my body was like telling me like, you know, th- this is what you're desiring when it comes to, um, you know, like who you're attracted to and, you know, and, and all of that. And then also like, th- this is like what your body is sensing, like politically, like this is a little weird of like why right wing politics are married to your evangelicalism, like all of that. Like there was just something very deep very visceral in my body. And later on, I recognized that being the spirit of God moving within my body, telling me, actually, you can trust that gut intuition. And that's actually me, God, the spirit of God telling you, this is the way I want you to go in your life. And so um, the thing that I always tell people uh, who are kind of in that stage where they're like, I don't know what to know what's true anymore. And I really tell them, you actually do know what's true because it's deep within your body. And that's actually the spirit of God talking to you and follow that spirit. Um, I just so happen to always believe that the spirit of God is always leading us to justice and, and truth and liberation for, for people. And so, um, so yeah, if you really feel that like deep sense of your body that like, actually that would be liberating for my body or for, uh, you know, th- that's actually the just thing to do in the world. I think that's the spirit of God moving within you. And I actually started to trust that. And it took a lot of work for me to eventually get to the point where I could trust that and not just what I thought I was supposed to read in the Bible. So that was a really massive step. But but once I was able to do that, it kind of sent me down this really great slippery slope. That's been really fun to be honest. (laughs) The slip and slide. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I I, I resonate with all of that so deeply. Thank you for putting words on all that. The, the thing that I know that is difficult is, is when a person like myself is in a situation where everybody f- believes and thinks this way, and then you start to go, you know, this way, and then you start to go the other way. And, and you're suddenly like you, that, that social system that you established as part of that church body or that small group mm-hmm. or that uh, Sunday school class or whatever, 
um, it's very important for them to keep it together by kind of following the rules, by believing the same right. things. And when you start to say, you know what, what about this? It's you're very quickly ostracized or put on the prayer list or, you know, right. uh, talked about for sure, which just it, it's very shaming and uh, very isolating. I, I think it can be a very lonely time. Um, what would you say to somebody who's sitting in that place right now that is feeling extremely lonely because they yeah. feel like they are starting to listen to the spirit of God within them and that same spirit doesn't seem to be heard in anybody that's around them. Two things I want to say for that person is first off, it's okay to grieve the loss of that community. It's okay to do that. Uh, it might feel a little conflicting because you're like leaving a community that you think is unjust, a community that you think might be even oppressive to you and others, but it's okay to grieve the fact that you may have had years and years of a relationship with those people and all of a sudden you don't anymore. And that's okay to grieve that loss. So that's the first thing I wanna to say to that person. And I, and I think it's really important for them to like fully embrace that grieving process, okay? So go down that process. Once you have gone through that grieving process of losing that community, the next thing I want somebody to focus on then is that as much as you might have lost a community, know that there are so many other communities out there that actually are gonna embrace you for who you are and what you believe and what you stand up for. And there's gonna be, you might've lost one community because of that, but there are so many other communities now that you're opening yourself up to that are gonna love you for who you are because of that. And know that that community is out there and you can have hope for that. So grieve, but also know and also hope for the community that will love you and embrace you for who you are. And that community does actually exist. And you actually have opened yourself up for questioning your faith and exploring all these different questions and leaving that old community behind. You actually are opening yourself up for all sorts of other communities that will love you and embrace you for who you are and what you believe and what you stand up for. Woo, that's so exciting, man. You, uh, you've got such hope in your eyes. I, I love it. I, I think it's possible. I really think it's possible. Yes. I've experienced it. I know lots of other people have experienced it. So I know it's true. I yes. know it's out there. Yes. I, I, I want to see if you have any specific ideas for how somebody could find that new community. Um, but I also think it's, um, but I also wonder if there's a healthy way to look at the former at, you know, like you mentioned this grief and, and for me, some of the grieving is like, not throwing the the baby Jesus completely out with all the bathwater, but like going like, man, that formed me, that gave me some really good things, you know. So so uh, maybe before we go to how do you find that new community, like how how do you hang on with like with love and respect for some of the kind of the former as opposed to just like that was stupid. I didn't you know you know. Yeah, I don't want to be perspective. Perspic per I don't want to be uh, prescriptive about this, but. In my own experience, like you know, I've grieved like the loss of a certain kind of relationship that I have with my parents. I haven't lost my parents. Like I still love them and I still have a relationship with them. But there's a certain kind of relationship I can have with my parents now that had I stayed a conservative evangelical, it would have been a very different kind of relationship with my parents. And so I've gone through that grieving process. Um, but I've had to redefine my relationship. I've had to create certain boundaries with them. They've had to create certain boundaries with me, too. Um, and, and so I've been able to continue to have a relationship with my parents because we've been able to redefine it and set certain boundaries for one another. My parents are still super conservative. Don't get me wrong. Uh, and we disagree about a lot of things. In fact, I think there's a lot of things that they support that are extremely oppressive, evil, I would even say, but yet I still think it's worthwhile for me to continue to have a relationship with them. But for other people, they have to cut their parents out of their life where they have to cut other people that have been a part of their life out of their life. And again, I don't want to be prescriptive about it. Like if, if that's what you need, if you, if you can't redefine your relationship, if you can't set certain boundaries with certain people from that old community, then you need to do what's best for you. And again, I think within your body, you're going to sense what's true and what God is leading you uh, to do in those certain situations. Um, so yes, if you're able to redefine certain relationships that you have with that old community, 
uh, with the music you used to grew up listening to, with the church that you used to uh, to be a part of, with the the experience even with your past self even yeah, yeah. if you're able to redefine that great but if also if you need to kind of cut that part out of your life then you can do that too um for me it's been really healthy to just simply to redefine a lot of that so even the way that i used to relate to the christian music i grew up to uh, or grew up with uh the way that i relate to my past self the way that i relate to my youth group experience all of that i've had to redefine a little bit to think you know what i wouldn't be here today without that uh it certain certainly created a lot of harm in my life it certainly created a lot of hurt in my life uh, the, the, my youth group experiences, my time growing up in purity culture, uh, the relationships I had with my parents certainly caused a lot of issues, but I wouldn't also be here today without that experience. Um, but for, again, for other people, they aren't going to be able to think about their past selves, their past communities, their past experiences in that way. And so you need to do what you need to do in order to have a healthy relationship with yourself, um, currently. Um, and so if that means just cutting out that entire part of your life, that community, whatever, then that might be it. Uh, but for me, I've been able to redefine that. And that's been a really healthy way for me to relate to that kind of past. Awesome. What, so then the, the uh, second part of that, like, is, the, is there like a face group, group where people go and they become friends and they find this new community with <laughs> like thinkers or yeah. like, uh, not again, not to be prescriptive, but I, I'm just curious, like kind of how, how have you found um, new community? Yeah. So one thing that I think is probably unique about my journey versus lots of other people who might go on a similar journey in their faith as I have is that I, I did, I had this journey when I first started college. So I was already meeting lots of new people and already having to make community with new people. Uh, and so I was able to very quickly find the people at my college who also thought about faith the way that I was thinking about faith at that time. Uh, and I kind of uh, at least put up boundaries with the, the, the communities at my college uh, of people who used to think, about, or they were still thinking about faith the way I used to. Uh, and so I, I was very fortunate that I was able to find community very quickly with, with people at my college. Um, but even once I got out of college, I started seminary. Uh, and actually started um, getting really involved online. I was able to meet lots of friends at seminary and build that community that way. But also I was able to build community online with lots of people who were thinking about faith and theology similarly uh, as me. And that was really helpful too. And so I've built lots of lots of friends uh, and lots of lots of community over the last several years online and in seminary. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people who are going through this same like faith journey that I have, they don't have the benefit of doing it at a brand new college or at a seminary. Right. Uh, I think online really is an incredibly valuable resource of building that new community. Um, it's not to say that you will always have that same community. At some point, maybe you ultimately find different communities elsewhere, and that's totally fine. Um, but at least for a community that help you uh, work through that faith journey that you might be going through, I think online is a really great opportunity. A lot of people are doing that on Facebook, uh, on Instagram, on Twitter even, and now even with TikTok. I, I, I know there's kind of a burgeoning community on TikTok that's doing a lot of that. Um, and so there are lots of people that you can follow. And a lot of those people are actually wanting to be in a relationship with you too. And so uh, just start the conversation with them and see what happens. And before you know it, you might end up being on a podcast with, with Mark and uh, be talking about the same things. You just never know. You never know where the day will lead. I love that. Uh, I, I would like to hear, um, you know, like if we were to put this in kind of um, modern terms, like, so you went through this period of deconstruction, Mason, and, and like, I'm, I want to say like, obviously you've done some reconstructing too, or some rebuilding. And I want to hear like, what, what have been some benchmarks along the way? Um, some places that you, you know, you put your Ebenezer down or you, you're like, you know what, I, I'm going to stand by this. Um, and, you know, it might be as easy to say, you know, I just like got to know Jesus and decided that I'm just going to like do what Jesus says, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> so I'm curious how your journey has kind of developed into that. Like, how have you reconstructed? What are you, what are you hanging on to? Yeah. 
again, one of the benefits that I had that not everybody has that are going through this similar journey is that I started this faith journey, this deconstruction, if you will, while I was in college in as like a religion major. And so I was already really quickly getting exposed to different ways of thinking about faith and Christianity. Um, and so I really quickly was able to, if you will, reconstruct different things like, okay, I know I don't believe this about hell, or I know I don't believe about this about the Bible, uh, but this is what I do believe about the Bible because I was starting to get those kind of resources. I was reading those kind of books. And very, feel, very quickly. feel free to be as specific as you want, because I would, I would love to hear, you know, yeah. like when, when you say like, I, you know, the Bible, I didn't believe that it was literal anymore. I've just started to view it more as a book of truth. It was poetic and, you know, historical. Yeah. So it, as specific as you want to be. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, you know, I, I like knew, okay, I don't, I'm, I don't believe in eternal conscious torment and then, but, but I did believe this about the afterlife or whatever. And so, and then I would start reading books about that because those were the kind of books that we were reading in college as a religion major. Uh, or, you know, I knew that I, I didn't believe the Bible was this like literal book that was almost like this manual for your life. I knew that that's not how I read the Bible anymore, but I read it as like this story that I could see myself a part of. Well, all of that, like I, I knew that, or I sensed that to be true, and I started reading books about that. That, uh, and and so, yeah, like different examples like that. Uh, I, I was very quickly able to, again, if you will, reconstruct these different beliefs about Christianity. And then once I moved on to seminary, I was able to like expand that even more. I started reading things about like liberation theology, about how God is always caring for the oppressed and what that actually means for theology. Um, I started reading a thing called process theology. I'm very involved in that world now of like, how do I actually think about God that's very, very different than what I grew up with uh, in, in Christianity uh, as an evangelical. So I started reading all these other theologies while I was in seminary that really helped me, again, reconstruct what I actually believe about Christianity, about the Bible, about my faith. And uh, those were really, really helpful. And again, I had the benefit of being a part of an academic world where I was reading all of those different kind of books. Um, not everybody has that, uh, uh, that privilege. And so uh, for those folks, you know, things like these kinds of podcasts, you know, I have a podcast, a theology podcast. I hope it's helpful for people in that way who, who might not necessarily want to have to go to seminary to reconstruct their faith, but they know that they could listen to a podcast on the way to work or whatever. Um, but there's also really great books that I think are very accessible that everybody could read. You know, books like by Pete Enns um, are really great. Uh, there, there's a new book that just came out um, by uh, the person that runs Black Liturgies on on Instagram, and I'm actually going to be interviewing her soon. Um, and, and so that book is really great. You know, there's so many great books out there uh, that everybody can read that I think are really helpful for, okay, I know I don't believe this about Christianity, but I believe this about Christianity. And I just like need to read things or need to hear other people talk about it, articulate it in ways that actually make sense to me so that I know how to actually talk about what I actually do believe about my faith. Uh, and then there's a lot out there. I would, I would love to get um, your thoughts on like, say if we were to take uh, something specific like the resurrection, like we just had Easter, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, you, I go on Twitter, which I love because that's where I learn so much and, and hear about interesting mm -hmm. people saying things. And some people say like, it doesn't matter if it was literal or not, because the truth remains that God is a God of resurrection. Uh, mm -hmm. or, uh, but some people actually were like, no, it was actually three days, sort of. I mean, sort of, Friday to Sunday, whatever. Um, <laughs> um, how, where, where, is, where is a healthy place to land on a, such a theologically important or, or maybe Christ, Christianity-wise important um, right. event? Like, where, where's a healthy place to land on that, have you found? Yeah, specifically with the resurrection? Yeah, yeah. you know, for me... You know, I, I actually, I really just don't even care if it was like this, like literal bodily, like Jesus, di like actually died. And then th like two or three days later, uh, got up and was like resuscitated like a zombie. Like, I just do not care either way. Like just, I really have, I, I really don't have a stake in the game for that. Um, and also like, I think like th there are people in like, who think about Christianity more progressive 
uh, that like actually think that, you know, it was this like literal bodily kind of resurrection and have really great concerns about it. And I think that's really interesting. And I'm glad to hear those arguments. And then other people who think very differently who are also very progressive. And so for me at the end of the, the, at the, end of the day for resurrection, I think what resurrection ultimately is, is not necessarily about did somebody resuscitate the, from, from death. I think resurrection is all about living in such a way that oppression does not have the final word. So if that's the case, then you too, Mark, and I and everybody else listening to this can also live a resurrected life. Not just Jesus, but everybody. Because all of us can live in such a way where oppression does not have the final word. And so that to me is what resurrection really is ultimately about. It's not, I don't really care about what actually happened 2000 years ago with Jesus's body. But what I do care is that resurrection actually means something for us today. And to me, that means that we live in such a way that oppression does not have the last word. And so I think that's what oppression or that's what resurrection is all about. And, uh, and to me, when I think about resurrection, that's what I want to think about. I don't want to think about what happened to some dude's body 2000 years ago. Right. Well, that's blasphemy. And I'm done with you, Mason. No, that's, I, I love hearing that perspective. That's fantastic. I, I can't wait for all the zero star reviews your podcast is about to get from that, <laughs> that segment right there. No, no, I think it's fantastic because we as a church, we, we live liturgically. I mean, we live in this way where everything is symbolic. And then to say, well, well, that's not symbolic it is a little kind of dichotomous, you know, like even even like sometimes when we, you know, we take the, the cracker and the grape juice, we say, no, that is the body and the blood of Christ. Well, it's not. We're going, we're, it's, a, it's a symbol because there's something in it for us that, that we as You just lost faith. all your Catholic, Catholic listeners, by the way. <laughs> They're like, that is not just a symbol. That is his body and that is his blood. <laughs> Do, do the Catholics use the little communion kits that we got during COVID, you know, the little all-in-one thing? I feel like they've they've always had those, at least all the Catholic masses I've been to, which I'm not supposed to be taking communion at there because I'm not right. uh, baptized Catholic. Right. But they always have those little wafers, which I feel like that's what you want to call the body of Jesus. Like, that's really, that's it? Like, other churches are actually having, like, really nice, like, pieces of bread. Yeah. And you're going to say that little damn, like, wafer is Jesus' body? Like, what do you think about his body? My goodness. Anyway, yes. that's my that's my qualm with Catholics. No, that's all right. That's all right. But but back to the idea that so much of what we do is symbolic. And so much of how I'm starting to see the Bible is more symbolic, like that like um, poetic and mythical, which mm -hmm. which means there's great truth. It's not discounting the truth at all. It's not discounting just as powerful. Actually, even more so. I mean, we don't we don't sit down and tell our kids. We don't read them like scientific manuals on you know on how to you know, b build a car. We like we tell them stories. We awaken their imaginations. Right. We we remind them that there is good in this world and that there is hope for their lives. That 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 there is so much yet to explore in this world. And I feel like that is the essence of of what the scriptures are intended to do but it gets bogged down in, in literalism. Yeah. Sometimes people ask me like, do you think the Bible is inspired? And I think, I don't know if the Bible itself is inspired, but what is inspired is when you encounter those stories and you're moved in such a way where you're like, that's how I'm going to be in the world. That's inspiration. Yes. That's what's inspired. I don't, again, I don't know if the actual text in the Bible itself is inspired, but when you have that encounter with the Bible, that's inspired to me. That's fantastic. I love that. Ooh, one of the things that has been really transformative in my life over the last couple of years is to think about, you know, so much of the conversation around sexuality and Christianity right now is, you know, can you be a Christian and be gay? Or is homosexuality a sin in the Bible? Like, that's the conversation. And for a lot of people, that's the first conversation they have when they start questioning their faith. And I think that's an important question. But I had that question years ago. I'm no longer on that question anymore. I'm more interested now in less so is homosexuality a sin or does what does the Bible say about homosexuality? I don't even care about that anymore. What I care about is what does queerness have to do with our faith? Like how can our faith be queered? And I think about queerness as like an actual politic of like blending or blurring the binaries of life. 
you know, when we think about um, queerness, we, we don't think about just like gay or straight. Like there's this like blending that like, you know, there there's like, there's this fluidity in all of life. And I'm really curious of like, what does that have to say about our faith? What does that have to say about Christianity? That's the question I'm wanting to explore right now. Um, and so, yeah, when I think about sexuality and faith now, that's the question I'm asking. Not does the Bible, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? Can you be a gay and be Christian? That's not the question anymore. To me, it's more about what does queerness actually have to say and shape and form our Christian faith? So when you say that's not the question anymore, is it because you've you've already answered that and you're just moved beyond that? Yeah, it's just like it's to me, it's a non-negotiable. Yeah, it's like you, I don't even need to question that. It's just to me, it like the the bar is already low enough. Like it's just that's ex it. The assumption is that yes, you can be queer and be Christian, and uh, and actually to be queer and to be Christian is probably a more faithful version of being a Christian. Um, what? What does yeah. that mean? So, yeah, so again, like, I think like um, for, for queerness, if you really think about it as this like blurring of all the binaries in the world, um, I think there's so much about Christianity that's blurring all these binaries in the world. You know, for example, we have this binary of divinity and humanity. Right. And the Christian faith says something about how God became both in yes. the person of Jesus. Yes. There's this blurring of that two binary that in the person of Jesus, Jesus was both fully divine and fully human. I think that's a radical statement. And I think there's something very queer, if you will, about that. Uh, again, if you think of queerness as this blurring of the binaries in the world. And so, uh, yeah, I, I think like for people who are queer, there's something to be said that like, you're able to blur these binaries in the world that I think is really representative of what Christianity ought to be doing. Um, and, you know, when, when we believe things like the incarnation, that God became fully human and fully divine in the person of Jesus, I think there's something to be said about how that is a very queer act. Um, and therefore, there might be something to be said about how being a queer Christian is actually a more faithful version of being a Christian than if you were just this like heterosexual uh, cisgender type Christian. Nothing against those people, of course. Nothing, Nothing against them. They just aren't living the, you know, they're not living, they're, they're living in a more of a lukewarm kind of faith, if you will. Well, <laughs> I, that is a, that's a fascinating perspective. And um, it, it makes me think of how we choose these labels, these uh, binary labels, if you will, that I'm Republican, I'm Democrat, I'm conservative Christian, I'm a liberal, or he's a liberal, or she's a, <laughs> a whatever. Like we use these labels to try to seek this understanding. And, and what I hear you saying is that um, in this divine relationship that we're invited into, there's, there's, a, there's a releasing, maybe a surrendering of these labels so that we can be uh, perhaps more fully human and, and yeah. more, more fully authentic. and who we are actually designed to be. So what I hear you saying is that sometimes these labels actually hold us back from fully participating in our true authenticity. Am I right. close? Yeah, I think at its best, the Christian faith should destroy these binaries that we have in the world and create something new. That's the key piece, um, that these binaries, we don't have to just be stuck in either one of them but they actually are totally destroyed by our Christian faith. And we, there's something entirely new that's created. And I think that's what the Christian faith at its best can do. Well, okay. So one of my arguments would be, um, are you asking for a homogenization of everybody and everything? Or like, right. is, is there like uh, beauty and diversity? And like, how, where, where's the, where, where are you landing on that? Yeah. So I definitely like, I, I think, um, a diversity of all different perspectives is super helpful in so far that a perspective is not inherently oppressive. Okay. So I think that there needs to be Muslims in the world, that there needs to be Buddhists in the world, that there needs to be pagans and Wiccans in the world. Um, and that's just religiously, right? Like I also like, I think it's the world is benefited when we have uh, a diversity of different kinds of races um, uh, and ethnicities and different cultures. Uh, I think the world is really benefited when we have all of this diversity in the world. I think it's really, really important. 
insofar that one of those perspectives or one of those things is not inherently oppressive. Um, you know, for example, I, I'm a person who is really into prison abolition. I think that something like prisons is an inherently oppressive system. And there isn't like a diversity. I, I'm not interested in compromising with a prison system. Um, I don't think it can be just something uh, reformed. I want to rethink, radically reimagine what does accountability look like? What does wh how, what does rec uh, reconciliation in our relationships look like that yeah. doesn't completely depend on punishment of people, right? And so again, I think Christian faith at its best completely destroys this binary of uh, the uh, imprisoned and the free and totally completely gets rid of that system and rethinks completely what does it look like for reconciliation to happen when people have been harmed? What does accountability look like when people have done harm? Those are the sort of things that I think Christianity at, at its best is doing. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I, again, I think it, it's taking away that binary, it's destroying that binary and reimagining something new. Uh, and that's why I love the world of abolition is it's like wanting to destroy all of the systems of oppression in the world and then reimagine new ways of re relating to the world. I yeah. think that's like the beauty that abolition really offers is a new possibility. Awesome. I, I love that you mentioned that about prisons. I, when I moved to Nashville for 25 years, it was for Christian music. And I, and I very early on got involved in prison ministry and spent 23 years going in on a weekly basis, wow. hanging out with guys. And so my heart is with you on everything that you just said, um, learning uh, the futility of the prison system uh, up, mm -hmm. up close and personal. And um, so, man, anything I can do to help <laughs> join forces with you on anything, man, I, I'm, I want to I want to do that. That's fantastic. Um, you what you just said, kind of this blurring um, uh, of binaries, it, it makes me think that like something that I and probably you were raised with was a very binary, like good versus evil system. Right. Mm -hmm. God is good. Devil bad. Devil is very like roams the earth, maybe even the what what do they call him the prince of the earth even like like we give like the devil really a lot of power in in some conservative evangelical circles and and so we learn how to kind of figure out what is good what is evil and how to stay clear of that evil so that we are protected so that we can be holy and we're not you know polluted by the evil hence you know the Christian music industry, you know, like, like we, pre we create our own things, you know, our Christian coffee shops. Uh, right. And I, I feel like what you're asking is like, we need, we need to stop like labeling things as good or bad or people as good and bad and see that there is something sacred in everything. Uh, uh, as Richard Rohr says, like everything belongs, right? Yeah, I definitely don't want to go as far to say that there isn't evil in the world. Like, you know, something like the Holocaust is evil, right? Yeah, yeah. But I also want to, I think where evangelicals really get this conversation around good and evil wrong is that everything good has is like a, not of the body. It's something that's completely spiritual. It's not of this world. And everything that's evil is of the world. It's of the flesh. It's of the body. It's of the earth. And that's, I think, where the issue lies, is that I think there is so much goodness that is of our body, that is of the world, that is of the earth. And also there are times where the, there are things that are also evil that are happening of the world and in the world. And, um, and it's not just purely this, like, there's this spiritual good and then there's this earthly physical evil. And they're two very separate things. I think the spiritual and the physical are always in this mutual relationship with one another. And sometimes there are things that are really good that are happening in the world and in the spirit. And then there's things that are happening that are evil, that uh, are of the world, that are hap that, that is of the physical, and that even evil that's happening of the spirit. Uh, and so both are happening at the same time. Um, so yeah, I don't want to go as far to say that there like is no evil in the right. world, uh, that, you know, all of everything is good. Everything is sacred. No, I think there are things that are not sacred. I don't think prisons are a sacred place uh, or that system is a sacred place. Uh, but 
that there are things in the world that can ab absolutely be good. And there are, also, there are also things of the world that can absolutely be evil. Yeah, I like to think about it in terms of like um, things that build up and things that tear down. You know, the good things build up, the build up people, build up healthy systems. Uh, the destructive things tear down, tear down people and tear down, uh, tear down uh, healthy situations. And some of, some of the negative deconstruction happens just because this is earth and we've got disease and mental illness and like, um, and cars that like smash into other cars and people die, you know, like, it's just like, it's a really a, kind of a horrible place. Um, but that kind of motivates me to say like, how can I be somebody that builds up? How can I be somebody that is um, lifting up and, and declaring the beauty, looking around and, and pronouncing the goodness that I see? Because there's plenty of people that are sitting around kind of pronouncing how bad everything is. Um, and that's part of the reason I'm doing this podcast is like, I just don't want to be like, the church is bad. Everything's horrible. Like, it's like, right. there's, there's some beautiful things in Christianity yes. and, and I want to hang on to those. And it sounds like you are too, but I, I know that there's at least one person that's listening right now that is convinced that we are doing Christianity the wrong way. Uh, <laughs> you want to name that person right now? Just call them out right now. No. Uh, <laughs> but I know that there's a, there's a list. Obviously, there's a long list, and uh, you mentioned you know some within your own family. You know um, how 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 can we tell people that or help people understand that their perspective is literally just a perspective, and mm -hmm. and that their claim to rightness is um, maybe not a justified claim. Yeah, yeah, I. I... I think we should always do it in love, right? Um, that when we are talking with somebody who um, we think, uh, you know, are expressing or holds oppressive views in the world, that we need to, in love, tell them, hey, I think you're wrong. And here's why I think you're wrong. Um, and then also, I think it's really important for us to tell them what what it is in the world that we think is right what's just in the world and how we can be a part of it right like it's not enough to just say hey you're wrong but here are all the ways that you can be a part of what we think is just and good in the world and true in the world um and so uh and i'm a person who never wants to do that coercively like i am always a person like let's just invite people to be a part of that uh, and maybe at some point the spirit will move within them, right? Uh, I often think about the time when I first started really questioning my faith uh, and questioning like the right-wing politics of my faith. I can only attribute it to the spirit of God moving in my life. Nobody coerced me to start believing differently or start having those questions about my faith. At some point, I was just invited by the the spirit of God to rethink those kind of questions, rethink my faith, and re certainly rethink the right-wing politics of my faith. Um, and I think we can be that kind of person in other people's lives, but we can only do that if we invite them, right? Um, and so I don't think we can ever do that coercively. We can just simply continue to invite them. I would love and I hope that my life continues to invite my parents and maybe at some day the spirit of God will move in them just so much that they actually do really start to radically rethink their faith. Maybe, maybe that will happen, but I can never like coercively do that for them. Um, I can only simply invite. That's all I can do and that's all I'm called to do. And so for, you know, for those who are listening and you have those conversations with whether it's your parents or other loved ones and you're like, wow, I cannot believe what they believe. You know, you can tell them that they're wrong or you believe that they're wrong and tell them what the alternative in the world is, what you think is right, what you think is just. And all you can do is just simply invite them. That's all you can do. And underneath it all, there's this decision to love regardless of what somebody believes or how they vote or how they act or, you know, it, there's, there's a decision and, and I'm finding that healthiness in my life is learning. Um, yes, boundaries are great, but also like, how can I still love people that are completely different than me? How can I look and see the God in them? How can I find the divine? How can I connect with those other people? And I'm, and I'm so grateful for those opportunities because that's when I feel like 
life becomes you know magical and i and i feel like there's this godness that's kind of surrounding it all but when i focused on differences and and how i wish things were different and how i'm trying to like figure out how to change things and change people i just get kind of like tied up in knots right like i just kind of become an anxious kind of chaotic person and um but for me that has to start with believing that i am loved getting back to some of our original blessing mentioned earlier right. you know letting myself be loved and and claiming that that god is not sitting there going geez mark i wish you were different because then we could really have some fun you know like <laughs> god's inviting us yeah. right now into this beautiful love um uh, relationship that is not based on anything that we have to do or yeah. change yeah yeah there there there's your responsibility for the person who you really strongly disagree with your responsibility to them is not to change them all you can do the only responsibility you have is to simply invite them into this like different world that we all want to create that's all you can do is simply invite them and they might reject you and continue to reject you and that's okay but you can't actually change them that is simply, I really do think it's only the spirit of God that can really ultimately change them. Um, and if you continue to invite them, maybe they will start to sense that spirit of God that's like also inviting them to change. Um, but ultimately, it's not your responsibility to make that change. All you can do is simply invite them to a new world. I think that's a perfect stopping point, Mason. Yeah. There yeah. We go. Oh, my God.